Good morning. Our next Thanksgiving offering will have to go towards AC. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Okay, the eyes have it. It's okay. I, I can't take it on anymore. It's really, it's, this kills me every Sunday, believe it or not. I struggle with it, and um, it's been very bad for my health as well. It is what it is. Let's thank God for his word today. You know, today we are going to be welcoming, well, we are welcoming <laughs> Brother Kemi and his family to be with us. We have, I told you, and we have discussed this, he is doing an internship with us for a few months. And uh, at the end of the process, we'll make a decision with regard to having him become officially the assistant pastor of our church. And um, I had not known him very long. And don't ask me how my heart settled on him. I don't know how. I have told him so once and twice. And I want to say it again here. I don't know how. <laughs> um, I never heard him preach. I never spoke to him. Except once or twice, hey, I greeted him when he came to our church a couple of years ago. He and his wife as a young couple. And I was part of the ordination committee at Calvary when he was accepted into the ministry over there with them as a minister in the gospel. We, we didn't talk that day, I don't think, no. <laughs> I never spoke to him, never saw him since. But when I was thinking of, and I have been thinking about this for a long time, you know that, some of you. We have been praying about this, some of us, for a long time. Um, I didn't know what his educational background, academic background was concerned with. Theology and scripture and everything were concerned. I didn't know a thing about him. But I said, you know, I'll invite this young man to preach for us. I know, I know coming from Calvary, there will be good doctrine. <laughs> that I know. And I was in the States lying in my bed, very sick, by the way. When he was preaching, I always tuned to the program on YouTube live. And when I heard him preach, I said, okay, he sounds like me. So, not in style, the different kind of personality, but in content. And we have an issue with our systems here, so I want to shut them off, Brother Zach. But when I heard him, I heard his message to us, to you, because I wasn't here. It was a real blessing to my heart. And uh, I spoke to him a little bit. At first, he wasn't too keen on this. <laughs> I might as well be honest about it. So I let it go and prayed. And then he came back. And when he came back, I said, okay, so he came back on his own now. <laughs> there was no influence, no pressure, no nothing at all. And I preferred it that way. And I'm sure the Lord has guided in the process. Someone please turn off this. Something is causing a problem in the background, no? Okay, well, we'll see how it goes. But we thank the Lord for bringing him to be with us and his family. And so what I thought I would like to do this morning was to challenge us as a church. And I will make this one brief because I've spoken to you about these things. But I wanted to find a, a passage of scripture that would help us to focus somewhat on this aspect of our time now in the ministry where we are as a church. So let me ask you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'll read two verses. 
1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 10 and 11. First Corinthians chapter 16, verses 10 and 11. Let us pray. We thank you, Father, for your word today. We ask that you would speak to our hearts, dear Lord. We know that whenever your word is open before us, you speak to us from it. So may you give us receptive hearts, that we might embrace your word and willing minds that we might determine to practice your word in our lives and bless us in the doing as you have told us in your word not the hearers of the word but the doers will be blessed in their doing so bless us as we put your word into practice in our lives individually and as a church we pray in Jesus name at the end of the message, I'll have Brother Kemi and his wife come up and we'll pray for them. The deacons and myself, will, and we will all join together in the prayer time. Let me read the text. Now, if Timotheus, that's Timothy, if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear. For he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. Now, if you, were just, if you just read this on the surface, you might find it somewhat strange that Paul would give such instructions to the church at Corinth. But if you understood the relationship that Paul had with the Christians at the church at Corinth, you would know that, you would conclude that he had good reason for instructing them in the way that he does. So let me read the verses again. Now, if, and the idea is when or whenever Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he works the work of the Lord as I also do. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. That seems unusual for the apostle to write to the church at Corinth with regard to how they must treat Timothy. You'd think that a church would take it upon itself to treat its spiritual leaders properly. You'd think that. And we assume probably that there, there, there would be some in the church at Corinth who would treat Timothy well. But Paul wanted the entire church to be involved in this. Because he knew his, his own experience with them. I think I was telling you a couple of weeks ago when I was preaching from 2 Corinthians, that the Apostle Paul had a, a, a rocky relationship with the church at Corinth. You know, he, he had different kinds of relationships with different of the churches. With the Philippian church, there was an emotional kind of experience because they expressed love and they should care for the Apostle. And in some of the churches to whom he, the churches to whom he wrote, he basically wrote to them, not even as a pastor, but as a, as a theologian, as it were. For example, the book of Romans. He's, he's teaching them doctrine. But this church at Corinth was a problem church. You read 1 Corinthians, you see that. They had all kinds of issues. And the Apostle Paul had to write to them very firmly to correct some of the problems in the church. Well, you know how people are. Whether you are an apostle or a pastor, people don't like to be corrected. So there were, there were many of them in the church who were questioning Paul's apostleship. And so he had to be very firm with them on the issues. Well, now he's sending Timothy to them. 
And he tells them, I want, you to, I want to make sure that you treat him right. He cautioned the church to be careful of the treatment of Timothy. Because he knew how they had treated him before. That is Paul. Moreover, Paul was afraid that having had men like himself, the church there, having had men like himself and Peter, who was a, a, the, the leading apostle among the apostles of Christ, and Apollos, who was an orator, who was a great speaker, that they would, when they heard Timothy, they would look down upon him as if he didn't make the grade. And so Paul had to give them some instructions with regard to how they must treat the young man. Because the Corinthians would be inclined to belittle and disregard Timothy because Timothy was shy and timid by nature. He didn't speak out. He'd rather retire and not say too much about issues. He wasn't like Paul at all. So Paul writes and says, now, I, I, I want you to make sure that you treat him right. And in the passage then before us, what I have done is to gather what I have entitled some guidelines for the treatment of our pastors or ministers in light of the fact that we will want to be adding someone to our pastoral leadership. You know I make it very practical. So I don't have to mention names, but you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes. <laughs> and in this I see three important points or principles if you want. Three important points that the Apostle Paul makes in the passage. And I'll make it quick. First of all, he gives instructions to the church with regard to Timothy. Secondly, we, we discover his intention toward the church. Why does he give them those instructions? It is for their sake as well as Timothy. And in the final statement he makes, I will show it to you if you will see it with me, we see his insight into Timothy's worth of value in the ministry, not just to himself, but to the church. And so we, we begin with the instructions, what I call the apostles' instructions to the church in verse 10. Just look at the text again with me. Now, if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without what? Fear. That's the first one. Look down at verse 11. Let no man therefore do what? Despise it. No man despise him not. But conduct him forth in peace. Okay. So there are some things Paul talks about here. At the time the apostle wrote this letter, Timothy was traveling. Paul had sent him on a mission in Macedonia along with some others. And so Timothy was expected to arrive at Corinth shortly. Knowing what the Corinthians were like, Paul cautioned them to be careful of the treatment of this young man. And there are three things he tells them they must do as a church. And I want to challenge us as we welcome the brother and his family among us to take those principles and to apply them to our situation as a local church. There are three things he tells them. First of all, that they must welcome him. And not just to give him a formal welcome, but in fact, to be welcoming of him. I'll explain this in a while. That's the idea of bringing him in or, or treating him so that he is not afraid to be with you. You see, you see what Paul says. If Timothy comes, see to it. That means he's laying the responsibility on the shoulders of the members of the church. They must take it upon themselves to see to it that Timothy is we feels welcomed among them. That's very important. Just imagine, you, you can't imagine because you were in leadership position, but just imagine what it's like to be among people with whom you are working and serving, and you feel unwelcome. Imagine what it's like. 
you feel uncomfortable. You don't want, you don't know how to relate with, you know what I mean? You don't know how to relate with them. Because of their attitude or the spirit they have towards you. Somebody invited me to a conference in the States uh, a couple of days ago in New York, and um, we were discussing it. And I said, and they said, you know, there are not too many people from the Caribbean who is coming to the conference. So it would be very nice, it would be wonderful, Pastor Henry, if you could come to this conference. I, and my, my heart right away jumped at the occasion. And I asked, so who from the Caribbean is attending this conference? And they began to mention some pastor's names. And I told them honestly, you know what? With these pastors, I would rather not be at the conference. Honestly and sincerely. Because some of them have had the worst things to say about me. They have slandered me. They have maligned me. They have ill-treated me. They have belittled me. They have ignored me as if I don't exist. And I said, you know what? If I go to be among them, I will feel very uncomfortable. I will not put myself among people where deliberately where I am most uncomfortable. Pastors and church people. And I want to tell you something. As a church... As the brother comes among us, let us make sure that he does not feel afraid to be among us. Let us just say amen. amen. Paul says, bring him, see to it that he be with you without fear. That is, put him at ease. Make him comfortable. This might sound strange to tell a church, but it happens in churches. Sometimes the place where we feel most uncomfortable is in the local church. Because things may have gone wrong in our lives. Because people might judge us the wrong way. And they treat us in a certain way. And so we become comfortable among them. I, I want to say to you that as our brother and his family come among us, let us be welcoming of them. And how do we show that? Don't just go and say, hello brother, we'd like to have you with us today. That is not enough. We must make a conscious effort to reach out and practice what I call inclusion, first of all, and exercise care in our treatment of them. When visitors and new people and strangers come among us, it is not for us, it is not for them to reach out to us it is for us to reach out to them. They are not the ones who must reach out to us. They are not the ones who must come to us. We must be the ones to go to them and let them know we are happy to have them with us and we are welcoming of them among us. And furthermore, and I know it happens in our church as it happens in all other churches, we all have our friends and our families whom we see all the time. It bothers me in this church. I observe it. We have our people. We have our friends. We have our family we see all the time. And our friends we see all the time. And guess what? There are strangers among us sometimes. And after service, everybody goes to their friends and to their families and we leave the strangers standing by themselves. Is that true? That's true. So we're going to change that. Amen? Let me hear you, man. We are going to repent. Did you hear me? That's a terrible practice. We are going to repent. And we'll start today. <laughs> we'll start today. And all of us, there are some of us who have not reached out to the brethren. They have been here a couple of weeks. So... Form a line. Everybody will shut those two doors. Everybody's passing that way this morning. So we can reach out and welcome them among us. Amen? And we can include them. So if we are talking with our friends and family and so on, we can bring them into the conversation. Because it's not, we're not gossiping about people, are we? Are we? No, we're not talking personal stuff here. We're just talking generally. Isn't that true? Let me hear you. I hope you're not gossiping when you come to church. So anything you can tell one person, you can tell everybody. By the way, is that true of you? 
Because I think some of you come here to gossip. Say amen, man. <laughs> I know you're not comfortable with that. <laughs> That's okay. But what I mean is that we must include the brother and his family. And the other thing is we must exercise care of how we treat them. Nobody wants to be treated badly. Everybody wants to be treated a certain way. And I always tell you, if you want to be, and Jesus said it, if you want to be treated a certain way, then treat other people the way you want to be treated. Amen? Hmm. That's it. Do unto others, what's the rest? As you would have them do unto you. So if you are a stranger or a visitor or a young person or a young couple or going into ministry in a local church where people did not know you up front, then what would you expect? You'd want them to come and reach out and welcome you. Isn't that true? Yes, so we must do the same. So Paul says be welcoming. Secondly, he says be respectful. Of course it's put negatively in the text, but that's what he means when he says in verse 11, let no man therefore despise him. It doesn't mean that you hate him. The, the idea of despising means to look down upon or to belittle or to treat somebody as if they don't matter. I was telling a couple of weeks ago when we decided to have Brother Kemi come join us in our pastoral leadership that, you know what, you have loved me for 33 years. <laughs> you can give him all the love now. <laughs> For the next 33 years, love him. You have given me a lot of love, some of you. <laughs> and I'm sure the rest will come with some more later on. <laughs> but we need to treat them as if they are something, and indeed they are. Paul wanted the church at Corinth to treat Timothy with respect. Let me tell you why, because Timothy... I was telling you earlier, was a very receding personality, very shy by nature. He wasn't one who was, would, would speak out. That's why Paul challenged him time and again. And he, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says, let no man despise thy youth. And the idea is, don't allow anyone to look down upon you because you are young. Because <laughs> in those days, you know what, they didn't look at young people as anything. You were not considered to know anything until you were 50. <laughs> so our brother is re relatively young. But Paul is saying now, listen to me now, we know he's young, we know he's shy, we know he's reticent, we know he doesn't say much, but that doesn't give you any cause, any reason to look down upon him and treat him as nothing. Be respectful of him. And that's one of the things we must learn to do in churches to respect our spiritual leaders whether they are young or old. Amen? Whether they are young or old. Amen? Whether they are black or white. Amen? Whether they are from Ancillary or Forestier. Yes? Let me hear you, man. We treat them with respect. When I, as a young pastor, even as an older pastor, there are people in this church who treated me badly, disrespectfully. They spoke to me, they, in fact, they spoke down. They were dismissive. They would never have spoken to the missionaries that way. They'll never speak to a white man that way. They used to refer to the missionaries as reverend. And me, Marcellus. Well, that's my name. And I challenged someone one day. They met me in the, somewhere in town. Uh, they said, hey, Pastor Henry, Modi, no, 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 stop this man. Stop the hypocrisy. Behind my back, you have all kinds of things to say about me. And you call me Marcellus behind my back. So when you see me face to face, use the same way. Use it the same way. Call me Marcellus to my face. Don't call me pastor anymore. Oh my goodness. He turned white, red, pink, yellow, blue. Every color of the rainbow. And my attitude is, respect is not just when the person is there. Respect is also when they are not there. And I challenge you, even when you have disagreements with your pastor or, 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 or our assistant pastor, 
even though the disagreement might be sharp, that does not give you any reason to be disrespectful of your pastor because I want to assure you, if you are, the Lord will come back and deal with you for it. I can assure you of it. Look into your life and you'll see. Be respectful, Paul told the Corinthians. So as we welcome our brother, let us, let us be careful that we show respect. Because you know, Timothy was Paul's representative. So while we must not exalt our spiritual leaders as if they were gods, and don't exalt the brother. And I told you three years, don't exalt me. But neither should we disrespect, be disrespectful of them and dismissive of them. Neither gives us no right. Whether they are black or white or pink or yellow, uh, educated or uneducated, it doesn't matter whether they, their hair is kinky, like mine or straight like his, all straighter than mine. Does it matter? Do those things matter? No. Those things don't matter. I'll show you what matters in a while. Here's the third thing Paul says. So there must be welcoming. Let me hear you say the word. Let me hear the word again. That sounds better. The second one, there must be. Let me hear you again. And the third one is that there must be supportive. Where do I get this from? Well, look at the text where Paul tells them, not only must they not despise him, but they must conduct him forth in peace. To conduct him forth in peace means to bring him along the way, to accompany him, to escort him, and furthermore, at the root of this is the idea of providing for one's necessities for the journey. Hmm, that's beautiful. What is Paul saying to them? Paul is saying, listen, I want you as a church to stand by Timothy because he needs your support and encouragement. Amen? And I know this as a pastor, and those of you with, who relate personally with me know how important this is to me. Listen to me. The people out there can treat you as badly as they could. It can't touch you. But if people in your church treat you badly, it breaks your heart. And I want to say, I have had people, there are people out there in the community and out in this island who treat me with great respect and who have given me great support personally, even unbelievers that I have not found among some members of our own congregation. What a shame. Don't do this to our brother. Make sure that we support him. Amen? That we, ask, we stand by him. That we are there with him. That we help him in the ministry. That when he gives us counsel and guidance, we accept it. That when he's leading something, we follow his leadership. That's how we give support. And I want to tell you something. You don't have to agree with your pastor in everything to support him in the ministry. There are people who feel that they must withdraw their support. Why well, can't work with Pastor Henry? Well, find a pastor with whom you can work, for heaven's sake. Don't just sit your behind on the pews and say you can't work. Every Christian is responsible to be working in the ministry of the Lord, every Christian. And if you don't like the pastor, or you don't like the assistant pastor, and you feel you can't work with them, well, you know what? You have to go and talk to the Lord about that because God does not want us to be in his house doing nothing for him. We have to willingly submit ourselves under the leadership and authority and follow them. That's what the Bible teaches us. And you know, when we take a negative attitude towards our spiritual leaders, 
it is to our own detriment and to the detriment of the local church. So be supportive. So why does Paul tell them that? Well, the second point, I'll be brief with this one. We see the apostles' intent, or intention if you want, toward the church. Why should they be welcoming of Timothy, be respectful of him, and be supportive? Paul says to us in verse 10, Now, if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear or apprehension, as if he's walking on eggshells. For he worketh the work of the Lord. That's the reason. He is doing the Lord's work. And Paul goes one step further, you know. He's doing the Lord's work just as I am doing the Lord's work. Paul, Timothy could never work like Paul did. He didn't have the knowledge. He didn't have the ability. He didn't have the, the seniority. He didn't have the experience. But that was not Paul's concern. Paul want, wasn't concerned about those things. What was Paul concerned about? Paul was not concerned about Timothy's academic achievements or Timothy's personality or Timothy's experience or Timothy's knowledge. Paul was concerned about one thing and one thing only, that Timothy was doing the Lord's work in the same way he, the great apostle, was doing the Lord's work. And I want to say to you, as we welcome the brother among us, please don't compare him to me. Did you hear me? I, I was young, now I'm old. I have been here going on 34 years. So 34 years gives you a lot of experience in ministry. But are we concerned about that? No. I am a certain type of personality. His is different. Don't concern yourself with that. Concern yourself with one thing, that he is doing the Lord's work in the same way that Pastor Henry is doing the Lord's work. That's very important for us to understand. It's as simple as that. He works. I, I love the way Paul puts, the old King James puts it. That's Paul's intention here for setting for the instructions. He wanted the church to understand that though he was an apostle and Timothy's senior in age and in ministry, Timothy was no less a servant of Jesus Christ. In Paul's mind, Timothy was playing an equally important role in the ministry. He was carrying out the Lord's work. So however the brother serves, however he preaches, he's a pretty good preacher for a young man, I say. I hope he doesn't get to his head. <laughs> I know he loves the scriptures. He loves to learn it. He loves to teach it. And I, I am certain he will be a positive addition to the teaching and preaching ministry of our church. But here's what we must bear in mind. We must bear in mind that those engaged in ministry are doing the Lord's work. And we must be careful how we treat them. Amen? Let me hear you say amen, man. Those engaged in ministry are doing whose work? Whose work? This means, therefore, we are going to be careful how we treat them. Why? Because they are doing? That's right. That's not man's work. That's God's work. I hope you understand that. In verses 15 and 16 of this very same chapter, I'll close shortly. 15 and 16, Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruit of Achaia. That's where Corinth was, the region where Corinth was, um, of which Corinth was a city. 
and that they have done what? They have done what? Addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that is where the local church is concerned, that you do what? Submit yourselves unto such, unto everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. First Thessalonians, now chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. You know these verses. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which do what? Labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and do what? And to esteem them very highly in love. For what? For the work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. You see it? For the work's sake. And I want to tell you something. If you whole have a high regard for the Lord's work, you will have a high regard for those who carry out the Lord's work. Not their work, not their ministry. It is the Lord's. And you say what? This is the Lord's ministry. I will give support and show esteem and extend encouragement to those who are doing the work of the Lord. Thirdly and finally. So the first of all we saw, the apostles' instructions. There are three. They must be Secondly, thirdly, all right, you got it. We have the apostle's intention. Why does he want them to treat T T Timothy that way? What reason does he give? Because he is doing what? The Lord's work. That's it. Look at the third point. Verse 11. Let no man therefore despise him. But conduct him forth in peace. That means provide everything he needs. Help him along the way. Accompany him part the way. Be there for him. Support him. That he may come unto me. <laughs> so he'll go back to Paul. And furthermore, for I look for him. You see this little phrase? I look for him. You know what Paul is saying? I am looking forward to having Timothy come back to be with me. Let me ask you a question. Why do we look forward to have people back with us when they have gone away from us? Tell me why. We miss them. Why do we miss them? Because they mean something to us. Because they are worth something to us. They are of value to us. And that's what Paul is telling the church at Corinth. He wants them to know that not only is Timothy supplying them with someone who will be their minister, but that he himself, that Timothy, meant something to him as well. So Paul is sharing here with the church at Corinth, Corinth his eagerness to have Timothy return to him as soon as he was able thereby giving us an insight into Timothy's value to him. He was looking forward to having Timothy back, to continue to help him in the work of the ministry. Because Timothy was an asset to Paul and to the churches at large. A true blessing. I trust, brother, you'll be a blessing to us. <laughs> to help me and to help the church in the ministry. And in his letter to the Philippians, Paul said, I have no man like-minded. <laughs> That's just lovely. Who will naturally care for your state. Paul's heart was in ministry. Timothy's heart was in ministry. And Paul's heart was into Timothy. And Timothy's heart was into Paul. So you see what's happening here? So these two men relate closely. And guess what? They both love the same things. They love the work of the ministry together. 
There's nothing better. It was Spurgeon, I think, who said, one of the terrible things that happens in the church is to have a horse of a pastor and a mule of a deacon. Can I put them in this trouble, man? There are people who can never get to move, never get to go forward, never get to do anything because they have their peeves. They beef, if you want. They have issues. Not Paul and Timothy. <laughs> Paul loved Timothy. Timothy loved Paul. And guess what? They both loved the ministry of the Lord together. That makes for great companionship. By the way, you know, among all his... I, I, I checked this out. I said, let me check this man out. <laughs> Apart from writing his letters to Timothy, in his letters to the churches, Paul mentioned Timothy no less than 12 times. Between 1 Corinthians and, and 2 Thessalonians. He mentions Timothy over and over again. And every time he spoke of Timothy, it was with affection and trust and love because of what Timothy meant to him. I pray that our brother will be of great value to us. Timothy stood out as a true companion to Paul and a dedicated servant of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul was so happy. Paul was excited, anxious to have him come back. I am looking forward to having him back with the brethren. In other words, when the other brothers are coming, make sure Timothy is among them. So, one more principle. Our character in ministry is manifested in our attitude toward those with whom we are called to serve. You have me? Character in ministry is reflected in our attitude toward those with whom we are called to serve. There are people who always feel they cannot work with certain people. No, no, no. We should do the best we can to work with them. You know why? Because they are doing the Lord's work. Years ago, I talked to someone, no longer in our church, about this. And they were involved in ministry, and I realized, they treated me a certain way, so I called them up. I had a meeting with them, straight up. And I said, you know what, I realize you don't like me as a person. Oh, yo, yo. <laughs> don't do that. People dislike you for things like that. I said, I realize you don't like me. And I paused to hear what they would say. Oh, no, Pastor, that's not true. I like you a lot. Or I, like, or I like you a little bit. They never responded. I said, I realize you don't like me, but I want to tell you something. I am not here to be liked by you, and I'm not here to like you either. And you know my attitude about that. Guess what? So if you don't like me, I, have, I will like you. Don't fool yourself with that. Don't fool yourself with it. I think we are fooling ourselves to put ourselves on the people. So do our best to show them how much we like them if they don't like us. Listen, man. If someone shows and they have shown you over and over again that they don't like you, leave them where they are and walk away and go and serve the Lord with other people and to the best of your ability. That's my advice. I, I repeat the Lord's advice, but my advice to you. But I said to the person, I said, but you know what? Nonetheless, we are here to serve the Lord together. And I want to tell you something. As long as I am here and as long as you are here, I am willing to work with you to advance the work of the ministry. Whether you like me or not has nothing to do with this, but it shows our character comes through in our attitude toward those with whom we are called to serve. And we see this in Paul's life. You see that? Is what kind of mind Paul was? Check out Timothy and check out Paul and you will know that they were chalk and cheese. <laughs> but guess what? Paul loved Timothy and Paul gave Timothy every opportunity to serve in the ministry. 
And when Timothy went away from him, he missed him dearly because he knew he was missing someone who loved the Lord's work as much as he did. Let me close with two principles I want to share. Number one, let us make a conscious effort to reach out to those who are new among us and make them feel welcomed. Starting with our brother and his family, but we must extend it. You know what's going to happen this month? We are trying to re or strengthen our Sunday school, bring back those who have gone and have not returned since COVID, and to bring in new people. So we want to extend that as well. Let us make a conscious effort to reach out to those who are new among us and make them feel welcomed. Yes? Number two, and number last. Let us remember that those engaged in the ministry are doing the Lord's work and appreciate and support them for it. Amen? Now, I think if we would take these two principles and apply them, it would help us as a church. It would help us in our attitude towards our brethren here and in the general approach to those who are serving in the ministry. May the Lord give us the grace to apply his word to our hearts and lives today. Father, we thank you for your word today. May you bless our hearts as we consider these things. Help us to take heed to the admonition of the apostle to Corinth regarding Timothy and apply it to our own situation regarding our brother and his family as they join us in the ministry here. To be welcoming, to be respectful, to be supportive, to remember, to do everything we could to reach out, make them feel welcomed, and also to appreciate them for the work that they will be doing among us and to give them all the support we could. May you bring great blessing to us through them and to them through us. And may you be glorified in all things, we pray in Jesus' name.